Welcome back, dear friends. Long time no speak, especially regarding that. Um, I'm getting on with it again. I've spent, I think it must be about three weeks or something, four weeks building a barometric prognosticator for someone, which has been most enjoyable. But it's time to get on with, with the Steampunk Penny Arcade Machine and also the Steampunk TARDIS console. I think it's got to be about two or three years since I built this from um, the plans that Dan, who I'm building it for, kindly provided. Um, he's got some more funding for his, the film he's going to make. So I'm being able to get on with the next part of that, which I think is going to be the central column. That's the central column with moving parts. So that's exciting. I'm just working with him at the moment to sort out some details. Because it's one thing to design it on SketchUp in a virtual world, a completely other thing to build it in a workshop in the real world. Yes, so that's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to getting on with that. So you put a coin in, you lift this up, that rolls around, that drops down, then the gameplay starts. That's what we want. Because as that's going round, hold on a minute, there are the two hammers that correspond to each uh, of uh, fives and tens, whatever else. So they're still working and everything else is working, so I'm very pleased. And then of course, if a ball drops on here, that's good. Ooh. It whizzes around really quickly because obviously the ball's waiting to go around again or is out of play. So you don't want to be waiting there, standing there like a lemon waiting for this to go down to So that still works. And then the final thing to check is the resetting of this. Because obviously you want the previous score to stay on view for other people wandering around in the arcade thinking, Ooh, look, you can get high scores or not. So, as you lift this up, well, when you put a coin in, I'm cheating a bit here, you have to pull this little knob, and that releases that, and that releases the pulls, and then look, it counts back to nearly zero. We've got the counterweight that resets the score, we've got obviously the main pendulum, we've got a chain that moves the, uh, the release, the fast release thing, so I'm thinking about just taking this pulley out of here, turning it on its side so the chain comes over here, making another pulley so that the chain just hangs down. The important thing about doing that first is that it stops me from having to get on with the chains, and also I need to know where the chain is going to end up going when I make a support for the chimes. Oh dear friends, I'm terribly happy, I'm living the dream. I was a bit apprehensive, is that a word, this morning, um, getting back to that, because especially when I tried it and it didn't work, and I've fiddled it, fiddled with it, got it working, and now I'm making stuff, and I'm not rushing, I'm just enjoying it. And it is lovely. There's an original pulley, and there's one I've just made. And that was lovely, it took me a while to remember how to mount this on the lathe, turn it down, and suddenly... Duh. It's got three holes for the uh, chuck things. And I've just cut this out with the angle of the dangle. And that's going to sit somewhere like that so that um, the chine can come up here and then over the new pulley. And it's, it really is a joy. Oh, look, dear friends. Two more spinny things. Un. Duh. And what they mean is... The chain can come out of there, over here, down there, down the back, for the counterweight. Who can that be? It was Parcel Force collecting that huge box. So that's nice, because it means I can take the dog out now, because they go a, a window, a precise window, between 9 o'clock a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. How kind of them. This beautiful little addition means that, as I was so rudely interrupted, uh, the counterweight can hang down the back, out the way, so ne really the next thing to do to stop me getting on with the chimes is to... I, I think I might just get on with the chimes now, because now I know where this mounts. Which way round are we looking at? That sort of way. Um, I can now sort out where to mount the, uh, the two chimes and how to make them and everything. Let's just get on with that whilst the paint on this is drying. Let's talk about making noise mechanically. 
Now in the past, I have used, and have just used with a barometric prognosticator, a flute. And these are great because they have a weight inside, it wants to be a bit heavier. And you can also change the pitch of them by adding, as I do with the barometric prognosticator, a sort of swanny whistle arrangement, which is very effective. So that's nice. But it's not very loud, that's the problem. Then we come on to percussive instruments. I mean, I might use one of these later in the game, but the noise of the ticking is quite going to drown out most of the things. But there's the smaller versions, of course, like this bell. And I've also used several of them in the machines as well. And they're very loud. Oops, what's he want to do? So they're good. In fact, these are the sort of bells I've used in the machines like that. Or there's chimes, because I've also used chimes. I thought, oh yes I have! Climatic Revelator. Now the interesting thing that I've learnt is that you have to position these. Obviously you can hang them from one end, but the support points on these sort of things need to be 0.22 times the length, the overall length, in from each end. That is fascinating, because it means basically, it's amazing, that when you hit it, sound waves bounce up and down, and bounce backwards and forwards inside, and you want the supports to be at the nodes, so where the sound waves go through zero, this, there's no movement in effect, you don't want to have them where there's maximum movement, and I assume at the ends there's maximum, because then it bounces back. So if you... that's what I'm used to hearing. I cannot believe that that would ever chime like that. But, give me a moment, isn't that amazing? That is astounding, because I've tried making things that chimes and stuff out of copper before, and it's just a sort of heavy, dull, clunking sound until you do it like that. So then I went ahead and tried it with other things, like... A lump of aluminium tube, which again aluminium is sort of... Or even a piece of stainless steel. Or whatever. Hold on a minute. So here's a, that long length, suspended roughly in the right place. It's just amazing. And that is my favourite, which made me wonder about all this, because it is like a xylophone or a glockenspiel or whatever. Um, this is from a very, very, very old computer that came from a bank when it was being chucked out. And it was to tell you when it had finished some sort of very laborious, long process. process. I've, I have had this since I was a child, so I managed to snap the actual hammer off, but... Isn't that lovely? An electromagnetic there, solenoid rather, just pulls that down. Now that made me think of the sound boxes. Because I was thinking, well, these are all these other sort of ringing percussive instruments, they, um, they don't make that much noise. Whereas if I cover this over, I've got bits of lead line around everywhere, so that'll do. It is actually ringing, but it's so quiet. If I take that away, it's not amazing. So, I'm narrowing it down. Oh, and before I forget, because this I found fascinating whilst walking the dog in the park, I realised, I think it is right, although it's wild conjecture, that with this sort of enclosed chime in effect, the node point is in the centre. So that's why it can be rigidly fixed there. You know, I'm holding my finger on it. So isn't that fascinating? So the ends vibrate and the sound waves go backwards and forwards and the diameter must be um, correct to allow the middle to be where the sound waves bounce up and down and nothing moves. That's fascinating. It really is. So, after that little whittering section, but I found it quite interesting, um, I think I'm erring on the side of a chime with a sound box. And I looked up sound boxes and I've forgotten what the measurement is. I'll have to look it up again, but it's something like... Another great day in paradise. What a joy. A good night's sleep makes such a difference. It's lovely. So what I did was to do some research into resonant cabinets and things, sound boxes, and um, make some notes. Let me show you. 
amazingly, I had remembered 2-2. Two, two. I think it's that whole dance, fashion, I don't know, point two two. And then I was also, also remembered, it's amazing, that it was at the depth of the sound box needs to be a quarter of the wavelength, and you can work out the wavelength with that, um, which I thought was amazing. And then I was walking the dog and I thought, well, actually, it does make sense, the speed of sound and whatever. Anyway, amazing stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to experiment. I, I really like copper, because there's no copper on the game yet. It's just on the machine. So if I can get some copper things, also quite narrow, so there's room to have two next to each other, two different pitches, I'm going to build a box that fits underneath. It suggests, interestingly, because if you think about the construction of a xylophone, we have these two sides coming in with the, the bars as they get smaller and smaller. It suggests that the sound box should be the length between the two nodes in effect, which is where the things are fixed, which is handy, plus the width of whatever it is that chimes. And then the depth is the important thing. I will get that built, and during the meanwhile, I will also fix them on, because the pulley, which is under there, I've sprayed up both sides, and cunningly used a bit of plastic that I cut out of the middle there, um, to block any paint getting on the bearing, because the bearing had to be glued in. Oh, and there, there's that bit as well, so that's nice, I'll get them fitted on. Oh, it doesn't get much better than that. It's about living the dream. Needless to say, I haven't got a smartphone with all sorts of very smart um, frequency things, so I'm going to have to resort to the piano forte. I've actually discovered... That's by far the closest, it's middle C. So the frequency is 261.63. This is a frightening sum. That's the speed of sound in meters over frequency. And I think that's <laughs> I'm not filled with hope. That looks like it could come out to be an absolutely ridiculous number. Well, it could be more ridiculous. 611.5 meters. That just doesn't sound right, the wavelength of middle C. I don't know why, but I'll go and look it up. I didn't do it before I look it up on the computer. This is why I shouldn't be allowed near a calculator, let alone equations. Right, I, well, the website I was looking at said the speed of sound was 160,000 metres a second. It isn't, obviously. I thought that was wrong. It's 343. When you divide that, you get 1.3 metres, which is more realistic. But the computer says 78 centimetres is the wavelength. I'm going to go with that one. Although I suppose it does point out the value of having a very vague, tenuous idea of physics, science and things like that, and what's right and couldn't possibly be right. So I'll get that built and we'll see whether it actually functions in the real world. Interesting. Excellent. Here it is without the sound box. That's most exciting, and I've got the thing, the tube, resting on just some rubber bands and bits. That's great, and in fact it needed to be even longer because that's without this bottom bit. I found it increased the volume still further, removing that. Now, my next thesis is how to compact the sound box, the resonant box, shall we say, because there's not room on the machine for one that big. Because look, here's the back of the machine, there's the striking bits. That's, it's just, it's just too big. And oh look what's going to get in the way too. What a joy, what a beauty. Isn't that lovely? I'm very pleased with that. And it also looks lovely from the front. Because if you remember, there's all this stuff going on this side, a little bit unbalanced. That's a lovely thing about steampunk and things, adding stuff and just putting it where there's room. There are the um, hammers hammering up and down, and there really isn't enough room. So what I'm going to do, I'm assuming that the volume of this is important, so I'm going to try making a different shape one. I've realised why this project can be so frustrating, because much of the time I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing at all. You can make lots of different things out of gears, and you can make lots of things out of electronics and Arduinos and all that sort of thing. But this project has contained so many unknowns, like the um, escapement. 
I mean, I didn't know what I was doing with that. And now with the chimes and resonant chambers, I don't know what I'm doing. Let me show you the latest experiment, which may just work. Having been so impressed with this and just how loud that chamber makes it, and having read about how with lower frequencies you have a little oval slot in a tube or something, I've made my own. Now I cut a piece of this brass because it's the biggest, thickest bit of brass I've got and it doesn't really, it sounds awful. Let me just show you, hold on a minute. Pretty puny. Can you sort of, yeah. And that's without any bungs in the end. I've made two bungs so I can experiment with the, the volume of the chamber. I take it back. I think we may be onto something here. As soon as I put those ends in, look at that, that's amazing, look, we can, oh, that's, that's a joy to behold, and here's the Ziggy again, look at her, oh, that's just, she does love a good old scratch, oh, bless her. I is learning new stuff. Now I need to apply that learning to the steampunk penny arcade machine. I marked out how much room I've got here before it hits the mechanism stuff and just sawed off the pipe and glued on a disc of 2mm acrylic. And I was merrily experimenting away um, and I thought well I'd better put the bung in the other end. I'll replace the bung in that end. It's really quiet. And I started moving the bung up, Ooh. and it got really loud again. And what I realised was, I think, is the important things are the that's equidistant. So because I've cut that down, now by pushing that in, I thought leaving this as big as possible would be the best thing, but it isn't. It makes a huge difference. So this side it has to be symmetrical with the centre. And I also found that. Making the slot narrow with the cut through bits of masking tape and all the side, that made it even lower, louder. I'm losing the ploy a bit actually. <laughs> yes, right, so I'm going to saw this end down, do the same thing. I've done that end and realised, of course, it's not symmetrical at all. It has something else to do with the volume of the inside or whatever. But in other breaking news, I've cut the other chime. I was wondering whether to sort of combine the two, but I think for this top bit, I think it'd be nice to have two different notes, um, similar like that, given this limited space. But it also means, if this is all going to now fit up here, it means I have got room under here for some bells, whistles or whatever else that I later somehow link up to the rest of the gameplay. So much to learn. Another experiment. I want to work out how best to mount these. On the bigger ones, obviously like this one, they've drilled a hole and put a rubber grommet in and a rivet or something, a screw. I don't think there's enough room on these narrower bits to drill a hole because the sound might stop the sound waves going backwards and forwards. I don't want to risk that. So I've been experimenting. I experimented with a rubber tube which sort of worked but deadened the sound. Strips of rubber which completely deadened the sound. Bit of dowel, sort of worked okay. And the rubber bands obviously work. But then I thought I'd try felt. Like you do because every musical instrument like this uses felt. That works a treat. And in other news, I've made a couple of laser cut supports. So, I'll sit that on there, sort out my rests for the two chimes, and then we can test them. Oh, dear friends, that's, that's well worth a day's tinkering. I can tell you, the next job is to get that, the prototype, mounted on there. It's another lovely day, and it's time to design the supports for the chimes. I thought I'd do the design work on my laptop, 
so I could continue to enjoy watching the Chernobyl series, which is brilliant. It's the final episode I'm on, and it doesn't shy away from the science. It explains everything. It's fantastic. So many dramas and the documentary and things just sort of come to a bit of science. Oh no, you're all too thick to understand this, but this doesn't. Really impressed. Anyway, I've designed the bits. I've got them cut out, so now I'm going to sand them a little bit, sand them flat, get rid of the draft angle, get them together, get them fixed on. What can I do while the paint's drying? Well, I've suddenly realised, of course, that either I need to make a new one of these or use reuse this one. But of course, the, that stand snapped when I was pulling it off, having glued it in the wrong place and it's all scratched and it looks absolutely rotten so what I think I'm going to do is just try and snap these two bits off and then just spend a nice long time sanding this really nicely getting the ends smoothed and sanded somehow hoovering all the cack out of the inside that's got stuck I think that's what I'm going to do and funnily enough whilst I'm doing that I'm going to watch the whole series again because it's so good and fascinating this is probably going to go all wrong but I've used this lovely tool that finds the centre of circles to find the centre of the end. Now I'm going to drill a little hole so that I can mount this on the lathe because the lathe would be the perfect way because it really has ruined the surface of this to turn it all down beautifully. Well that's not too shabby and the hole in the end looks pretty much in the centre and I've got a rotating doodah there to support it so let's get that turned down. I think I'm going to stand over here just in case because if it does go wrong it's going to go wrong very quickly. Well that's good and I've created loads and loads of plastic candy floss but that's a much, that's quite a nice fine finish. I'll sand it as well. The great thing is now I can turn it round and just do this end bit if it needs it because it could be a feature having a little line there. I'll have a look and see. I want to cut the, um, the slot out really neatly and here is the closest thing I've got to a milling machine. I bought it when I first left college and was doing some job that needed routing or milling and I only had a pillar drill. So lovely. So by turning that little handle, oops, here's the second of two of the supports to fix it to the rods. When I was cutting out the first one, I was so engrossed with the uh, series I'm watching, I noticed that this, is caught, this had caught fire until I heard the crackling. Hey, you just can't afford to leave these alone for a minute. Look, dear friends, she managed to get the drill holes lined up this time, finally. So that's for the steel rod, and I'm just tapping this one. I've started off by using the drill tap, and I've drilled a hole already, but it guides in perfectly so once I've got it aligned because I want to go right to the bottom I'm going to use a bottom tap or a bull nose tap pleased to be called because the the cutting part goes right to the end so you can cut the thread right down to the bottom of the hole so there are the two rods they're 3.3 millimeters diameter they're actually um, welding rods so they're steel mild steel covered in a thin layer of copper to stop them rusting with some lovely little decals at the bottom. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to somehow position this um, and then glue these on fixed to the rod so I know that it all fits and sits in the right place. All positioned and glued into place. Lovely. Now I've got to decide what colour to paint this. The nice copper rods there that just don't want to risk making it look all odd and crazy, so I need to have a think about that. Well, I'm very pleased that I chose the cast iron paint. That looks absolutely delightful. Mm. Right, I need to bung up the hole at each end, that's right, and glue the chimes on and then get it fixed onto the machine. There are two ways of filling the holes up. I could cut little discs, plastic discs, and glue them over, but the hole just deserves a screw, if you go to my drift. Two ways of doing it, I could use a um, M5 brass dome nut, but I'm running very short on them. And it would stick out quite a long way. I think I've got some M5 brass screws. I think I'm just going to do that. I'm pleased with that. How did I get the nut on the inside? Well, after some cogitation, 
I found a bent old Allen key that I'd jammed into a socket and found a socket for six millimeter, five millimeter nuts. A bit of masking tape is screwed up inside to hold it in place and it just pokes through and lines it up. I wonder when this video will ever end. Everything with this project takes so long. A couple of new issues have arisen. I'd got the chimes installed but then it was back to the same old problem where the hand, the scoring hand, wasn't going far enough. And because it wasn't going far enough, it wasn't lifting up. And it's just something that keeps rearing its ugly head and bugging me. So what I did then, if you remember back to some previous video, this moves up and down, is attached to the pendulum. And that pull pulls that scoring wheel thing round, ratchet. Um, so it wasn't quite at the end, so I've moved it right to the end, so the maximum movement as the pendulum swings. But then that means that it wouldn't release properly. It did work, it pulled it around, but it wouldn't release. So then I had to fiddle around making an extra little bit of plastic so that both they would lift properly when I wanted it to reset to zero. Got that done, really pleased, but then the chimes didn't sound right. And I was thinking, what could possibly cause that? And I, I, I rang them, chimed them, and they just sounded wrong. And it's because I had glued them with rubber base glue onto the felt. And obviously once it has set, it didn't work. So after copious amounts of experimentation, I hope this is valuable to someone other than me, I've cut up a nice thick rubber band and glued it exactly underneath where the um, the centres are, and this has already stuck itself, I don't want that to stick on, off. So there's the centres for the smaller bit and equally under here, and it works and it sounds great. So I'm about to put that back onto the machine and we'll have a final go. Hopefully I can have a nice final shot of this being chimed properly. By Jove, I think it might be working. Um, but during the meanwhile, while I'm tidying up and stuff, I realised that I had these little brass balls and they looked splendid on the top of the um, uh, steel rods. A little top tip, because I didn't want to glue them on with super glue, because when this all goes horribly wrong, which inevitably it will, I'll be able to get it off again. So a temporary way I found is to wrap a little bit of masking tape, one with the masking tape, this is 3.3 millimeter, and these are drawn out to M4. And then you can just screw it onto the top, and it just ties itself onto the uh, masking tape, and really does screw on quite tightly, quite firmly. I'm very pleased with that. Even though I say so myself, the effort that has gone into every single aspect, absolutely ridiculous. But I've learned a lot, yeah. Right, let's see if it works. Lift the handle. The chain does what it's meant to. Yes. Oh, lovely. And it generally works. <laughs> That's a random aspect. Obviously, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't pull itself far enough. But it's an awful lot better than it was. And that's nice having the sound. And it is loud enough, amplified loud enough, to be able to hear it above me wittering and all the clockwork stuff. Handle's down at the bottom, the white. So now I can pull this and reset it. Lovely. <laughs> Third time lucky, but don't tell anyone. I've shown you all the other features with the balls and the coins and all that, so I won't do that again this time, because I don't suppose any of it will work. But I will try to release it, you know, when the, one of the balls hits the bottom, just to see whether I've managed to destroy that part of the mechanism. Let's have a go. Right, so you're applying away, counting down, and then one of your balls drops into one of these channels. Yes! Excellent! That's definitely a good place to finish this video. I'm so pleased to have got the chimes working. As this, everything with this project takes ages, I think, oh yeah, I'll just quickly get this video finished, get the chimes done, I'll do that, you know. 
Everything takes so long because it's so overcomplicated. It is amazing, but satisfying when it does finally work, sort of. Thanks very much for watching. Next time, very exciting, hopefully starting on the TARDIS console, Steampunk TARDIS console for Dan, and also carrying on, at, well, actually starting on the gameplay itself. Who would have thought I'd finally reached the day? What, 11 videos later? Oh, it's ridiculous to actually start on designing the game. Lots of exciting stuff. Thanks very much again to all the people I've listed at the end who continue supporting and encouraging me. Really nice, very kind. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, remember to click on bell and all that stuff. Hope to see you next time. Thanks again.